The King Richard Petty will say goodbye. Jeff Gordon, who will be making his first start here today. Davey Allison is in the prize. And now it's going to come down to two. Will it be Alan Kowicki or Bill Elliott? Today, at this racetrack, an entire chapter of NASCAR history will be written. Just 12 days ago, America turned the page on its own history book. Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton is the first member of the baby boomer generation ever elected President of the United States. The time of Ronald Reagan and Richard Petty is coming to an end. NASCAR will soon have a whole new generation of young drivers, led by rookie sensation Jeff Gordon. In November of 1992, the country decides its new leader, and NASCAR determines its champion. It will all happen here, at Atlanta Motor Speedway. And to see so many things come together at Atlanta Motor Speedway on one day. There was four or five different storylines to that particular race that year at Atlanta. It is the final race in the 35-year career of a NASCAR legend. That was the end of the of that particular segment of my life. And it's the first cup race of a young hot shoe from Indiana. Right time, you know, Rick Hendrick calls and I knew that's where I wanted to be right away. I haven't seen that kind of talent a young driver before. We're not only gonna go and sit on the pole in our first race, we're just gonna blister the track record. It's gonna be so fast, it's gonna be ridiculous. It is also the culmination of one of the closest championship battles that NASCAR will ever see. It was all about personalities. How different was Bill Elliott from Alan Kowicki, from Davey Allison? And I really feel like we have the best team in Winston Cup racing right now. This is our time to go, you know, overcome something. I've never been through anything like it in my life. Davey Allison's season has come to an end. Every pit stop, we'd have to push him out of the stall to help him get going. So all these things that happened, that happened for a reason, for some reason, they didn't keep us from winning. There's the checkered flag for Allen. He's the champion for 92. That race eat my guts for a long time. Winning the race was one thing, but we lost the championship. But it was meant to be. It was his time to win that championship. It was a change in times, which it should change. It's not for eternity, you know? Randall in North Carolina the headquarters of Petty Enterprises. By 1992, the best days of the organization are long past, and Richard Petty wants to end his driving career gracefully. The Fan Appreciation Tour had come up, you know, the year before. It will be my last year next year, and it will be known as a Fan Appreciation Tour. My year was spent really going around and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, buddy. That's Hi, Richard Petty. Okay. This is Matthew. Give me five. Daddy's big thing is fans. It's all about the fan. So some people said, well, you're just doing this to make money and, and, all, and all that. But, you know, Daddy really wanted to reach out and, and to give something back to the fans. And I think that all the opportunities that he gave the fans to come up and personally touch him or mm -hmm. sign an autograph, just to say thank you. I've never seen that many crowds around someone in my life. I still today, you know, when I see a crowd coming, I usually figure it's Richard, you know, heading our way. That was a hard year for him personally. All he wanted to do was drive a race car. The only piece he had during that year was when he was sitting behind the wheel on a Sunday afternoon. The rest of the time, there were concerts with Alabama, there were autograph sessions, everywhere he went, it was a big deal for that city. There was always a pre-race ceremony the King was always involved in. We had everybody from 
the star drivers to the President of the United States giving them something. Richard, I'm proud to be at your side. He always told me, he said, you need a 27-year-old Richard Petty. I think he knew where he was at. There were certain tracks he felt really comfortable on because still felt like he could get the job done and win. The other tracks probably didn't feel so comfortable with. I had done my thing in racing. I was on the downhill drag. We wasn't really being that competitive, running that good. I got to gracefully get out of this deal here, you know, and I don't, don't want to just quit. We knew how much you wanted to do it. And we knew the end was in sight. And we just kept praying that he could make it to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The King's Last Race will be covered by a sports network eager to tell the story right. The 90s are already good for NASCAR and good for its television partners. By 1992, an event that had so many characteristics, they went all out to try to do whatever they could, not only to make themselves look good, but also to, to make the sport look good. Obviously, we had plenty of meetings, but you know, with, with Bob, Benny, and Ned in the booth, and Jerry and John. We here at ESPN, very proud to bring you this final race of the 1992 season as we wrap things up. They were so pumped about it, but because they're, they're true race fans anyway. Benny Parsons and I, I think we were in hog heaven that day. Out and man, that's exciting. Have six drivers that are in the championship hunt in the last race of the season and Richard Petty retiring at the same time. Ken Martin was in the booth and he was, he and still is a stats guru and a historian. He already had the scenarios figured out on what would happen if this happened, what would happen if that happened. I had built a computer spreadsheet with each driver's points coming into the race and then what their points would be for each position as they run. Kenny Martin was one of the, the best statisticians in the sport. I mean, he certainly was a real friend to those of us in the booth. We finally have a championship that all the drivers have to run as hard as they can go. Don't you think, Ned? Oh yeah, they gotta go for the win. We are entering one of the most exciting races ever in Winston Cup racing. Before the 1992 Hooters 500, the contenders test their cars at the rainy Atlanta racetrack. Drivers handle the pressure of the championship differently. Bill Elliott tries to stay focused. Regardless of what I feel right here, I mean, you can just leave that alone. I mean, right here, we're supposed to be here today testing, and that's what we're here for. We ain't here to do interviews and all this other stuff. You go into that atmosphere and you've got one of the favorite sons that Georgia has ever had in Bill Elliott. And where are you at? You're in Atlanta, Georgia. We've already fought all the battles. Now this is for the war. Davy Allison is grateful for what he has achieved and resigned to his racing fate. We're very fortunate to be in the position that we're in right now with everything that's happened. We're, we're enjoying life. We, we've learned a lot this year, both as a team and personally, and no matter what happens, we can walk out of 1992 holding our heads up high and knowing that we overcame a lot of obstacles and a lot of adversity. Alan Kowicki enjoys the role that he has played for the entire season. The underdog. You know, it's just a little bit out of our control. I think we have a good chance a lot of things can happen. Um, but we've got to beat Davey by more than one or two positions. We've got to beat him by five or six. There were three real players going into that race. But mathematically, there were six players. You've got to add Kyle Petty, Harry Gant, Mark Martin. Six teams, six drivers going into Atlanta that could mathematically walk away with the championship. If you talk to, to any of us, we felt like that those three guys had to crash on the first lap. And if they crashed on the first lap, then it was Katie Barr to the door. In the years leading up to this race, superstars had left the sport. Bobby Allison, Benny Parsons, Buddy Baker, K.O. Yarborough, obviously Richard Petty retiring. The sport needed new heroes to step up. One new hero came to NASCAR from the most unlikely of places, the short tracks of Wisconsin. 
when he finally decided that he was going to NASCAR, he just sold everything that he had up here and he packed up his truck and he was always a person who had goals. And so his goal was to not only compete in NASCAR, but really to end up winning a championship. I was swimming for my life when I moved down here. I wasn't thinking about the championship. I just wanted to compete on the NASCAR circuit. I wanted to get a ride. I wanted to be one of the drivers on the circuit. There weren't any rides for me. There weren't any opportunities. So I went about trying to create one for myself by owning my own team. Trying to win a championship as an owner driver makes Kulwicki a throwback to the early days. But he also brings a new approach to NASCAR. Um, you know, Alan was, was probably the, the, the one guy that started bringing the engineering side into NASCAR. That was his goal, was to make sure that NASCAR went that direction. I tell guys today, we, he set race cars up with a four grain scales and a four foot level. You know, tape measure. Grain scales. You can't even go to a grain place now and find a grain scales. And him being an engineer, man, he was driven. He was a uh, control freak. He would ride you and ride you until you wanted to just quit. And you, you'd get mad because we can't do any better, but you say to yourself, yeah, oh yeah, watch this. Well, I can, I'm gonna prove it to him. And that's, that was his way of getting more out of you. And I always called us a bunch of misfit toys because that's what we were. We were just a bunch of misfits. And we beat them powerhouses. But it is Alan Kowicki winning the inaugural Checker 500. To celebrate his first win in Cup, Kowicki tips his hat to his heritage and circles the track backwards. His first Polish victory lap. That victory lap there is something I had thought about for a long time and I wanted to do something special and never be another first win and I just wanted to give him something to remember me by. Ford Motor Company wanted Allen to come to the Budweiser race team. I walked Allen through our race shop and spent about a half a day with him. And he said, Brewer, you have no idea how much I would love to come here and drive the car and race. But he said, Brewer, I have to do it myself. At this very moment. Today, in Atlanta, Alan Kulwicki is in position to fulfill his lifelong dream. But other drivers have the same dream, and only one will win the championship. Davey, you are in the lead heading in here to the last race. How are you holding up, buddy? I'll tell you, John, right now I'm just incredibly nervous. I don't think I've ever been this nervous in my life. Not only a championship at stake here today, but perhaps as important, it's the final race for a guy who started his career back in 1958 and has become the king of stock car racing. It's Richard Petty's final ride. Petty, start your engine. The end war, Petty. helicopters now in their hover and begin to chase the field as it goes around this one and a half mile oval. The crowd rises to its feet, salutes the field as it comes down. The green flag waves and the Hooters 500 is underway. But Davy Allison did not get through. The damage to the rear is enough to slow down the number 28's run for the championship. But this team has overcome problems worse than this all year long. The first third of 92, I've never been through anything like it in my life. Coming to the strike, Morgan comes to the inside and Davy Allison is going to win the Daytona 500. We would win one week, wreck the next. Win one week, wreck the next. The fact that they even let him get in the car 
how you can see through this red, solid red eyes. He won North Wilkesboro with a bunch of broke ribs where he had wrecked the week before at Bristol. By the time we got to the Sprint All-Star Race, we figured out how to do both on the same night, wreck and win. Here comes Davey Allison to the bottom. It'll be the finish. Everybody was waiting for it. They crash past the finish line. And Davey Allison is in a shower of sparks. He won the race, but he sure paid the price for it. The physical injuries he suffers are bad enough. But Davey Allison has to deal with a much more serious pain, the death of his younger brother, Clifford. After Clifford's accident in Michigan, it made me sit down again and, and say, OK, what is important to us? I want to spend a good life with my wife. I want to watch my kids grow up. That, that came to the top of the list right then. And we want to win a Winston Cup championship. The team had overcome so many things throughout the year. A lot of different things happened. It always seemed like that, that, that whole group just bounced back all the time at, at the oddest of times. Raymond Fox and Joey Knuckles and, and Eric Horn. I mean, we were all, I mean, we were all together. That camaraderie allows them to keep up with the 11 team of Junior Johnson and new driver Bill Elliott. Junior really wanted Bill. Budweiser wanted him. Junior Johnson, he got it done. He got, he got Bill. We're just tickled to death to have Bill aboard on our team, and I think he's going to do us a great job. I think it's going to be the tool that makes our team a top-notch team and, and a champion next year. There's where the best equipment at that time probably was. It would be like driving for Jack Roush now or driving for Rick Hendrick now. We were rolling along pretty good till we got to Charlotte and broke the rear track bar mount completely off the car. That started the snowball. We go to Phoenix, water temperature went way up, and we stopped probably 10 times during the race, putting oil in it, putting water in it. I mean, it was a total disaster. Their disasters give the number seven car hope. But a wreck late in the season makes Alan Kulwicki want to abandon his dream of a championship. When we wrecked that car at Dover in a race, and he, he hauled us all in the truck, and he said, guys, this is it, we're done. I don't think he ever had to give up in his demeanor, but yet he was also very realistic. You know, he said, well, this doesn't look very good. You know, our championship hopes maybe not over, but this doesn't help none. This really hurt us. The team took a huge turn then. The opposite way went, went to the complete opposite, and everybody was absolutely not. You know, there's no way. We can, we can come back from this. We can win this championship. You know, we're not going to give up. You know, we're going to keep digging it. He had instilled his philosophy into the crew so deeply that they wouldn't let him be a loser. Alan saw what we wanted to do, and he saw the enthusiasm. He saw what we were trying to accomplish. So we all rallied around each other and said, yeah, we can do this. You know, Junior's got a good team, and Bill's been really hot in his car. And, you know, they're off to a fine start this year, but we're doing pretty good ourselves. Don't count us out. In the last race of the year, Colwicky's championship dream is still alive. But the first pit stop of the day quickly becomes a nightmare. And Alan Kowicki's Hooters crew will go to work. Car number seven on the bottom of your screen. You're watching the Havlin crew on the top of your screen. Two competing teams trying to win a race and win a championship. Meanwhile, Alan Kowicki cannot get his car in gear. Five gets in gear. When they let the jack down, he let the clutch out. The car would not move. You can imagine what's wrong with that car. He put it in gear, and he, when he jammed it in gear, and it was on once, he said, just, it broke the idle gear, but going to first gear, so he didn't have first gear. First gear's broke, okay, it could be anything. You know, so you just gotta ride it out. The best thing to do is to put your, put your transmission in fourth gear and never take it out again for the rest of the day, and that's because if you start shifting your transmission, you're gonna move the broken parts around even more, and you're gonna have a chance to have a catastrophic failure, and you'll have nothing, you know, so you'll be out of the race. It just killed our pit stops all day long. The points as of this moment. Allison is in sixth position, but still maintains the points lead. Kowicki is second, only 10 behind.
thousands of fans are here to see Richard Petty's last laps in NASCAR. They don't know it yet, but they are also witnessing the first laps of another brilliant career. We had an amazing year in uh, in 1992 in the in the what was in the Bush Grand National Series now nationwide, but driving the baby Ruth uh, Ford for Bill Davis. Jeff's still looking for that elusive first victory. Could have come here today. I sure hope so. Things are really going good for us this weekend, and uh, you know the pole was just one step, but uh, we got another step to conquer, and that's winning this sucker. But I tell you, it, as well as it's going, I think we can do it. And Rick was there, and he he saw that, and mentioned to somebody that worked for him, you know, hey, you know, how do we get a hold of this kid? I haven't seen that kind of talent a young driver before, uh, not knowing it impressed me as much as he did, and he's going to be around a long, long time. And so it was the right time. You know, I sat down with him, and it was, uh, you know, I, I knew that's where I wanted to be right away. Jeff Gordon is doing well in his first cup race. But he stays out of the way of the championship contenders. It was great to be out there racing with those guys. Looking for Davy Allison. Here he comes out of the pack to try to pass. I didn't want to screw their day up, you know. <laughs> I mean, they were battling for a championship, uh, so I, I, I didn't want to interfere with that. So that was definitely a message that was clear to me. You know, go out, have a great race, but let's not interfere with that. Don't come in contact with Richard Petty either. <laughs> you didn't want to do that in his final race. Richard Petty isn't fast enough to win his final race. All he wants is to finish. Let's go out, finish the race, and we'll park, put that thing in the truck, and take it home, and the party will be over. Oh, crash! Down the front straightaway. And Richard Petty is flaming, going into turn number one. When he caught on fire, we obviously captured that and everything, and so the immediate response is for me to, to take the shot of him inside the car with the onboard camera. And then the F-bomb started flying. Bring it the extinguisher. And I told the audio guy, okay, we've heard it once. I think we can get rid of it. We don't need to hear him say that again. He is the king. Yeah, they got you. I pulled up to the fire truck. The guys jump out of the truck wanting an autograph. I said, wait a minute, guys, put the fire out and then we'll do, you know, we'll talk about this. You know, everybody always wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. I just went out in a blaze. And this may be the final farewell. We went back to the garage area, you know, to see him, and we were all crying. Because <laughs> we wanted him to finish. We wanted him to get the checker flag. I mean, it was all knocked off the front end, off the coolers, radiators, no fenders. The car was really tore up. I was, you know, hurt a little bit that we didn't run uh, better than I thought the, the effort that we had put into it. We said, you know, hey, we, we, we're going to make that last lap. And so they got to working on the car. And they, they didn't want me to run the last race and not finish, okay? We may be a little premature in telling you that Richard Petty is out of the race because they're working on the car. Hopefully he'll be on the track when the checkered flag drops. The rookie soon follows the example of the veteran. You know, Jeff and I at that time ran uh, our the Bush Grand National car extremely loose, <laughs> and, but it has you know 200 horsepower less than the Cup car. Needless to say, we missed the setup pretty bad. Obviously, I was just pushing uh, the car, uh, you know, as hard as I could, and pushed it too hard and jumped in the gas a little bit too much in the middle one and two and around it went. I remember that part very vividly. <laughs> Jeff Gordon will wait for 1993 to make better NASCAR memories. Today belongs to three competitors striving to clinch a championship. The 1992 NASCAR championship will only go to the team that can outrace the competition. Everybody that day 
ran as hard as they could run. Everybody. Because that was the only way you were going to beat those guys. You had to outrun them. There wasn't no holding back that day. Nah, you had to beat them. If the wiki could get in front, lead a lap and go on and lead the most lap. Put a lot of pressure on baby Allison. The wiki leads that lap. He's already picked up the five bonus points. And this is neat, gentlemen, seeing these two battle for the lead. Allen knew that during the race he had to um, fight Bill as hard as he could every single lap. You know, you know I think Bill and Allen swapped the lead half the race, it seems like. I don't know what the actual statistics are, but it seems to me like it was every lap, you know, they were they were fighting for the lead. Every lap that was led, we were keeping a tally. Allen led this lap, Bill led this lap, Allen led this lap. You're, it's out of your hands. It, it's, it's, it's up to Allen, it's up to the racing guys. It's like, and Allen could drive. Allen was a good driver. Uh, Bill Allen's a good driver. Uh, so you just like, it's good racing. And that's what you, and that's what you wanted to see. Here's Gowicki trying to get by Elliott. But you're sitting there going, just, just don't, don't wreck. <laughs> oh, but spoke too soon. Look at Bill. He's coming back on the outside. But no, Kowicki is going to lead this lap by a half a car length. Here comes Bill Bunn. Takes the lead, Bunn. That's the way to race for a championship. That's the way to go for a championship. While Elliot and Kowicki battle for the lead, Davy Allison. He's just trying to work his way back through the pack. And I knew we were not where we needed to be. We were a top 10 car, but you know what, Robert Yates horsepower, you should have been able to have a baby carriage and be a top 10 race car. But a mistake by a novice pit crew becomes another obstacle for the 28 team to overcome. Jeff Gordon is on pit road. His car very slowly down the backstretch. He was able to make it into the pits. We were the Keystone cops on pit road. It just was, uh, man, it was a, a, a tough day because we, had, we left a roll of duct tape on the deck lid and it fell off on the track. And Davey Allison hit it. They have been told that there may be a problem with the car. Davey just yelled to the crew, I think I run over something on the track. It totally killed the way the car was driving. We knew it was early enough in the race that we're going to have to bite the bullet. We've got the people. We've got good people. We can fix this and not lose a lap. I remember we were making patches on pit road, screwing them to the car, and riveting it to the car, and, and organizing all this stuff. That's the time for the guys that work on cars. That's when they get in the game. That's their time to serve. And that's kind of how I, I felt about all that. You know, this is our time to go, you know, overcome something. And lo and behold, our guys stepped up to the plate and did it. We have to make multiple pit stops to fix that. We finally had overcome all that. We were running exactly where we needed to run. He was running in fifth position. That's the position that Davey needed to be in in order to win the championship. And we were trying to find us a hole to run in, and then, of course, it got closed up. That sight is the sight I still see almost 20 years later. Oh, oh look out. Crash. Davey Allison is in the crash ball. Oh, Ernie Irvin, and it's all over for Davey Allison. No, it's not over yet. I don't think he hit him that hard, maybe. Got a lot of damage to the right side of the car. Ernie Irvin. Spinning, coming off of corner number four. Davey has got his car moving. Yeah, he's trying to pull away. But he can't but stare it, it. But it won't turn. It won't turn. The right front will not work. Yep, yeah, it's over. Championship. Hopes are over. That was it. The championship was gone, and we knew it. Davey Allison's long, tough, emotional season oh. has come to an end. with everything that Davey had been through, our team had been through. We wanted to finish the 1992 season on the racetrack. And off they took running up pit road to try to wait for the car to be pulled in. So believe me, there is no quit here in this Havlin team. We didn't quit. That was a sense of pride for Davey Allison. That's just how we were, everybody. Davey Allison goes back out onto the racetrack. A 
think the only sheet metal on it was the roof and a couple of doors and maybe one of the quarter panels. And I said, you know what? That makes a classic statement about the 1992 season in Davy Allison. We never gave up, but we wasn't in victory lane or holding that championship trophy like truly we should have been either. The two remaining competitors must strive for every point they can get. Both will receive a bonus for leading one lap, but only one can collect the points for leading the most laps. The calculations, simple. Lead every lap you can lead. You didn't have to tell me what was going on. I knew what was going on. Bill Elliott has been told that he needs to pass the seven car. Well, he's what he's trying to do. Every lap with every ounce of horsepower that Budweiser Ford will muster. Now, Alan Kowicki has been told by Danny Glad, the crew, he must keep the 11 car behind him because if he gets passed, he may not lead the most laps and he may lose the race and the championship. So these guys are running wide open. No, there's no computer technology. There's no live timing and scoring. We got stopwatches. We are, we're let manually counting the laps with a, on a piece of paper. Every time he goes by, you put an X. But neither team has enough fuel to make it to the end of the race. Both must have a flawless pit stop for gas. And both must finish near the front to have a chance at the championship. Paul, we're talking about pitting on lap, what, 306, 37, somewhere along there? Yeah, something like that, you know, we're, I mean, it would be crazy to put tires on, probably just going to gas and go. Yeah, it's, you know, anything could happen, this is not over yet. Elliott is way up on the racetrack. Well, it stays out there. Yeah, he does. But he can't run out of gas down the front straightaway, he'll lose everything he runs out now. Yeah, that seems like it's just rolling the dice a little too much. Hard to understand why they would even gamble when they got to stop anyway. Why would they gamble on going two or three more laps? They told Allen the pit that time by. Their calculations are it may not make it back. They said, you got to come in. So now he will come around and come in this lap. And he let Bill go by. And yeah. now we'll watch for Allen Woodkey to make it down pit road. How long it will take him to get gas only and be able to get back on the racetrack. Can't make no mistakes. From Paul making right calls to praying that the car stays together to Allen doesn't do something crazy. Unfortunately, we had a different circumstances. We didn't get car full. I'll never forget looking down there and watching him come down pit road at me and knowing I'm the only soul on pit road and TV and God and everybody's watching. I'm like, please don't screw up. The gas can only go in as fast as I can open up the vent. And I think it was like three or four seconds of gas we had to have and it, it, it wasn't even that. Less than four seconds for fuel. Man, could he have got enough fuel in the know. car in three and a half seconds? Well, I wonder about that, Jerry. All the guys were like, did you get a full, did you get enough in it? And I go, I just counted the three, I guess. I don't, you know, my three and your three may not be the same three. And I'm now I'm panicking. They got me nervous that I didn't get enough in it. Look at that can. Did it get enough of it in there? I tell you, the can still looks awfully heavy. Now, there's not much they can do about it now. If they didn't get enough and he doesn't make it, that's it. My wife, she was eight months pregnant and uh, she was at the race. I said, look, if this thing runs out of gas, I said, you run like hell to the car. You crank it, and I said, because these guys are going to kill me if we run out of gas. Somewhere along the line, we had to come, up, come across the radio. <laughs> and uh, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny, but funny, very funny then. We had to come across the radio and say, uh, okay, Alan, we need you to conserve gas every chance you get. There's a pause. Okay, what do you mean? <laughs> so, well, we believe we've got enough gas in there, but, you know, we're not 100% sure. You know, if you got an opportunity to conserve, you know, you need to conserve. You can't lose second place, you gotta stay in second. Here comes Bill, here comes Elliot. Elliot drops down off the banking. Bill Elliott heads down pit road in the Budweiser for Thunderbird. This could decide the Winston Cup Championship. Tim Brewer and the crew standing by. Watch Henry Benfield, he's a veteran gas man. Gas going in the car, sitting down. 3.4 seconds, Elliot is away for an identical pit stop. 3.4 seconds for both these guys. Who got enough fuel in to finish the race? So when Bill pitted, kind of a miscue, so to speak, uh, we went back on the racetrack. Terry Labonte stayed out, led two laps. 
Those two laps are the difference. NASCAR quickly tabulates the points of the championship contenders, and the broadcasters do the same. Ken? Who is it? Because NASCAR's still calculating. I was shaking. My hands were shaking. And I write the note, and I give it to Bob, and I show it to Ned and Benny. They held up a little legal pad and said, are you sure? And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, this is, this is a big deal. Kowicki has led the most laps. Oh, not, official. not officially yet. All right. We'll wait. <laughs> Boy, this thing is going to go down to the bitter end. Man, man. Kowicki was supposed to stop on lap 306. He ran the 309. Those three laps got him in front. And Ken goes, Alan Kowicki, you sure? Absolutely. And then we put it on the air. We are not following the leader of the race. We are focused in on Alan Kowicki, who is going to win the 1992 NASCAR Winston Cup. Bob was uh, comfortable with those numbers, and Bob was able to make, you know, one of the great calls in, in NASCAR history. Bill Elliott comes off the fourth corner. That, that day is, is, is notched in my memory forever, and other than my kid being born, that's probably the greatest day of my life. We were the underdogs, you know? We were the underbirds, and, and we did it. You know, we went out and, and beat these guys with multi-million dollar sponsorships. You know, here's this group of guys, and we go out there and win this championship. It's, you know, it'll never be done like that again. That was pretty, pretty amazing, it really was. We're all, like I say, once, once a misfit's here, we did it. So it was cool. It was cool. And Richard Petty is taking one final lap around this racetrack as the fans salute him and his career comes to an end. Here comes Kawicki down the front straightaway. He and Richard will probably collide because I'm sure Kawicki's going to do something spectacular. Let's see. Remember his first win at Phoenix? He took what he called, and there these are is. his words, a Polish victory lap. Yep. And guess what? He's going to do it again. <laughs> His He's hair. combing his hair. He had a comb <laughs> down there. I wonder what he was looking for. As Alan Kulwicki celebrates, Victory Lane hosts one of the most disappointed race winners that NASCAR has ever seen. Very, very hollow feeling. Yeah, you won the race but you lost the war. Everybody comes by and goes, hey, he, he knew he had to lead all the laps. He knew he had to do this. Well, hell, you think we didn't? One lap and one position was enough. November 15th, 1992, forever belongs to Alan Kulwicki and his crew, who took on the biggest teams in NASCAR and won. It was the day that the king took off his crown. For the final time, the king, Richard Petty, will say goodbye. And there are many dry eyes down here. We went up in the truck. It was Sharon and Lisa and Rebecca and Linda. And they was all crying. And I got to crying because it was the last race. I feel so glad for him that he was able to do it the way he wanted to do it even though I know inside, I know he was some, a part of him died that day, I'm sure. It 
means so much more to me today, knowing that I got a chance to race with Richard Petty in his final race. But other than that, it wasn't a very memorable day for either one of us. <laughs> he went up in the ball of flame, I spun out and hit the wall. It was a memorable day for Alan Kulwicki and his team. Now, forever, a NASCAR champion. Alan was the bridge from the past to the future. He was the engineer before we had engineers. He was the owner-driver when owner-drivers were on their way out. I'll tell you, this is just the dream of a lifetime. I've been the underdog a lot of my career, and that's the way I want people to remember me. Maybe it'll help uh, some of the people that are dreaming about doing this to uh, believe in themselves, and you know, if I can do it, maybe they can too. The driver responses after that race were so pure. It's been a long year, and you know, regardless of what happens, it's been one of those type seasons, and a lot of things has happened, and I mean, I'm just glad it's over with. This you know, I've run that race a thousand times in my mind. And to go out, the, race, the thing I remember most about it, when we didn't win that championship, I mean, it was like the world stopped. The world kept turning for the number 11 team, but their best chance at a championship was gone. They won only one more race together before Junior Johnson retired a few years later. Thanks for everything. Thank you. I'm glad this is over. The year's over. I'm not glad it ended this way, but I am kind of glad that it's come to an end now and we can go get some things sorted out and get ready for next year. It's just, it's just almost cruel. Nah, it just wasn't meant to be. Davey Allison kept smiling, but the rest of his team was devastated by the disappointing end of the day. We didn't have anything left. We barely made it to the car. I mean, just walking up the little bank there, it's like, Phew. I look back at my 18 years as a crew chief and go, that was the year that the championship just got away. Ifs and buts, you know, if that didn't happen, or if this didn't happen, a cut tire, a little damage, you know, all these little things. If any, maybe one of those things didn't happen, our whole day is different. We're celebrating. But the day ended. Triumph turned to tragedy just four months later. I'd ridden my motorcycle to Bristol, and it was raining, foggy rain terrible and was flipping channels just sitting watching TV um, and they had a breaking story stock car champion Alan Kowicki and four others were killed last night in the crash of a private plane Kowicki's plane went down as it approached an East Tennessee airport near the Bristol International Raceway where he was due to race this Sunday we elected to you know sit out of that race NASCAR shut the track down and I was able to make the lap and didn't want to do it, but I'm glad I did it, because um, it was for him. Watching Alan's truck drive around the racetrack, it's like nobody wanted to be there. That's the saddest racetrack I've ever gone to. The season of suffering wasn't over. This morning, the 32-year-old Allison died from a fatal head injury after his helicopter crashed. In July, the NASCAR family endured another unthinkable loss. And, uh... I'm sorry. <laughs> he had a little saying, and he was very committed to this saying. There ain't nothing going to come up today that me and the Lord can't handle together, and it has certainly helped me get through the things that I've had to get through. You look at just that year, and especially that last race. Richard Petty ends his career. Jeff Gordon starts his career. Alan Kowicki, the last owner driver to win a championship, beats the king of the hill, Bill Elliott. And in the next three or four years, the total face of the sport changed and became Jeff Gordon. And it became Rick Hendrick. And it became the Jack Roushes. That was almost the final chapter in what racing had been. I would say that that race did have as much to do with the changing of the guard and identifying the sport as any other race.